thank you, Doug, for the invitation to present here. And I'm looking forward to getting to know many of you over the next months and years. Oh, okay. Um, so, supposed to be this? All right. So, I guess I'll stand here behind the podium. <laughs> it feels a bit formal, but uh, so can you all hear me better now? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I was just saying thank you, and I'm looking forward to um, meeting many of you over the coming months. Um, I wanted to um, share some work with you about the effect of immigration on the economy. Um, this is joint work with my uh, long-term collaborator, Ron Abramitsky at Stanford. We've been working on the age of mass migration period um, in the late 19th and early 20th century for the past 10 years or so. It's also a joint project with my graduate student, Elior Cohen, at UCLA, and our collaborators in Denmark, Philip and Casper. So the picture uh, that you see um, on this title slide um, is a canonical picture from Ellis Island. Um, we see immigrants waiting in rows to be processed for entry to the US in the early 20th century. And these immigrants were coming almost entirely from Europe. They were unrestricted unre in their entry. They did not need a visa for entry. Um, and they had very limited requirements uh, before arrival. And so we are going to be thinking about the transition from this period of open immigration to a period of border closure and restriction in, that took place and unfolded over the course of the 1920s. Uh, this picture here illustrates uh, the change in regime in immigration policy by looking at the share of the US population that's foreign born from 1850 to 2010 um, using US <coughs> census data. And so we see that during this age of mass migration period, 14% uh, of the population is foreign born. Then the quotas that we'll discuss um, in a few minutes um, are phased in over the course of the 1920s. And the share of the population that's foreign born starts to decline and bottoms out in 1970 at around 4%. At that point, uh, the border uh, reopens in a constrained fashion in 1965 and the share foreign born increases until uh, 2010 uh, when it reaches 14% again. Um, so ultimately in this research agenda, we're hoping um, to use a similar type of approach to look at the constrained reopening of the border. But today I'm gonna talk only about um, the period of border closure. Now this uh, political cartoon from the period um, well illustrates the policy change. So we see um, a number of migrants, prospective migrants interested in moving from Europe to the US at the top of this funnel. And before the quotas were enacted, almost all of these migrants would have been allowed entry. And then we see a funneling process where Uncle Sam is standing on the shores of the US and he's holding up a card that says 3%. And this number here um, represents the first component of the policy change, uh, which takes a, a account of the stock of migrants in the US as of 1910, and says that the new entry flow, the number of quota slots are going to be equal to 3% of that stock. And then rather than take the full stock, what the policy did was break that stock down country by country so that the stock of Brits, the new flow of Brits would be 3% of that stock, the stock of Germans, so on, and then go down the line through the series of European countries. But this is a, uh, a cartoon from 1921. So this represents the first policy change, um, which took place in 1921 and was then further revised over the course of the 1920s. By the way, um, the perspective of this cartoonist is that this is, quote, the only way to handle it. So this is a cartoon in favor of border restriction. Now, um, what we can see illustrated in this picture is how the policy changes over the course of the 1920s. Um, and so uh, the 1921 policy, which is illustrated here, um, took 3% of the 1910 stock of immigrants, broken down by country of origin. So here I'm just showing you um, the stock in 1910 uh, from Northern and Western Europe and the stock from Southern and Eastern Europe. 
and then the balance is coming mostly from Canada. Uh, and so if this policy had been the one that prevailed, then it would be that around 50% of the quota slots would have been allocated to Northern and Western Europe, and 50% would have been allocated roughly to Southern and Eastern Europe. But that's not what prevailed in the long run. In 1924, this policy was changed again, and it was scaled back in two ways. One, rather than use the 3% number, the number of entry slots was cut down by saying, instead, we're going to take 2% of the stock. And then secondly, rather than use the 1910 stock, we'll use 1890, which sounds innocuous if you don't know much about the history. It sounds like, on its face, a neutral policy change. But now take a look at the 1890 stock of immigrants. 80% of them are coming from Northern and Western Europe. And so this policy change is going to cut down on the flow, but also is going to weight the flow, tilt the flow even more so uh, to the older sending countries. OK, so what we do is use these major changes in immigration policy to ask how the economy adapted to immigrant entry, or in our case, sort of a restriction of immigrant entry. Um, and we're going to use two sources of variation to do this. The first is before and after the border closure, but that would be a national change. And so we're going to weight that policy change down to the local level by using local exposure to the policy or the share of the initial population in a location that was affected by the quota. And we're first going to look at do those locations then get reductions in immigrant entry? And if so, we can then assess what happens in those locations as immigrant entry falls to the native born in the workforce. This analysis is based in part on an earlier paper um, that was circulating um, by two of our co-authors, Philip and Casper, um, under the title Closing Heaven's Door. And you'll see in a few slides that this has actually become quite a burgeoning literature. So something that we've been working on, and Philip and Casper have been working on, and now many others, um, presumably in response to the recent uh, proposals in the administration um, for um, immigrant restriction. So what we find is that historical immigration facilitated city growth and transition from farming to industry. So in exposed areas, locations that were more exposed to the policy, after the border closure, we see the following things. First, we see fewer immigrants arriving to those locations, especially from quota-restricted countries. We see that for every immigrant that was lost, one fewer internal migrant arrives. So actually, in places where immigrants have been flowing in, native-born internal migrants were also attracted to those areas. This is in contrast to what people typically find today, where they usually find either no relationship between immigrant entry and native entry, or they actually see somewhat of a displacement or a kind of a repelling effect that where immigrants flow in, so a few natives may leave. Instead, in the past, we see almost one-for-one -one attraction, that where immigrants are arriving, natives are arriving as well. And they're particularly natives who are holding blue-collar positions. And so, this is quite interesting. Uh, we see both in terms of the internal migrants that are flowing into an area, as well as the existing native-born workforce who stay in the area over a decade. We see that in both cases, when the border closes, there's a shift away from blue-collar work towards farming or towards a no-occupation category, which can include unemployment and retirement. Now, if it were the case that immigrants and natives were substitutes in the labor force, we would expect quite the opposite. That if, when there's a restriction on this substitutable form of labor, and immigrants are no longer taking the blue-collar jobs, then that would be an opportunity for natives to flow in to the blue-collar jobs. But what we see is the opposite. We see that when there's a restriction on immigrant arrivals, that discourages natives from moving in, to the area, particularly in blue-collar sector, or from shifting to blue-collar work for those who remain. What that suggests is that there are scale effects that outweigh these substitution effects in the labor market. So this is the way that labor economists think about what happens when there's a flow into an area of a particular factor of production. So in this case, a flow into an area of immigrant workers. When there's inflow of a factor of production, the price of that factor will fall, and firms should shift towards using that factor. 
and away from substitutable factors. So that's a substitution effect. And that's what people have in mind when they say immigrant entry may take away jobs from native workers. Firms might shift towards immigrant workers and away from natives. But another thing is going on in the background, which is that as the price of immigrant labor is falling, that lowers the cost of production overall, and firms may scale up their production. As they scale up their production, they increase their demand for all factors. And that might outweigh the substitution effect. So even if immigrants and natives are substitutable in the labor market, it could be that the scale effect dominates. And that's what seems to be going on here. OK. Um, so what we're finding is actually quite consistent with what we classify as widespread agreement for commentators at the time that immigrants encourage city growth and industrialization in this historical period. So we surveyed numerous articles and books that were written um, in the lead up to the border closure. There was a quite active debate going on within academia and policymakers about whether the border should close. Regardless of whether the author was in favor or opposed to border restriction, all authors said that immigration facilitated the growth of the factory sector, manufacturing, and cities. So here's one representative quote, uh, Peter Roberts saying, every city in the union that has doubled in population in the last decade, the foreign-born immigrant is an essential factor in that increase. The increase of our manufacturing industries also reveals a debt to these foreigners. So if this is a quote written by someone who is a, in favor of border restriction, typically they would say, look, I grant you this. I grant you that immigration facilitates industrialization, but there are costs to immigration as well that we just can't bear. And those costs are typically assimilation based. So there's a concern that immigrants are very different from us, especially the new flow from Southern and Eastern Europe. They don't speak our language. They don't have the same religion. And they'll just never fit in. Where there is more there, where there was more debate on the economic side is what then happened after immigration facilitated city growth to native workers. We have some um, commentators at the time saying that when immigrants arrived, native workers were crowded up so that they would take slightly higher status jobs within the industrial sector. We have others who said that, that native-born workers were displaced. Um, and so that an, was an active debate at the time, and our results are more consistent with the crowding up. So here is one um, such commentator, Edward Steiner, um, and he says things that are quite similar to what people say today when they say immigrants take jobs that native-born workers do not want to hold. So he says, for example, no considerable group of the native-born um, would want to work in the mines. So no one's bewailing the fact that they cannot find work in the mines when immigrants come in. Um, instead, what happens is that um, they're crowded up from the lower and coarser tasks. So that's one point of view. The alternative point of view, and the one that ended up prevailing, um, is represented here by Jeremiah Jenks, who's one of the authors of the um, Dillingham Commission report um, that was written uh, as a precursor to the closure of the border. Um, and uh, he uh, was an economist at Cornell. And he says, look, I grant you that there are some native born who are crowded up and that take on higher status positions. So he says here, you know, because of the general demand growing in industrial expansion, uh, there are some native born who rise to more skilled and responsible executive and technical positions. But a large proportion of the native born have left certain industries such as coal mining, iron, and steel manufacturing. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, even this sort of uh, negative view that it was in favor of border closure um, does say there was a demand that comes out of the growth of the industrial expansion. So on both sides of the debate, there is an understanding that that immigration facilitated industrialization, and that's precisely what we find in the data. And then the active debate is that what happens as a result to the native-born worker, was there displacement or was there crowding up? And as I mentioned, um, our paper joins a burgeoning literature in um, un using historical immigration policy changes to understand the effect of immigration on the economy. So the way I would classify this literature is that there were two seminal contributions in the early 90s, um, one by Claudia Golden and one by Tim Hatton and Jeff Williamson. And then there was essentially crickets. There was nothing um, written uh, using immigration policy changes um, until 
uh, the past few years. And so we have Hannah here, um, who has written with uh, Michael Clemens and Ethan Lewis about ending the Bracero program um, in the mid-60s, the so guest worker program. Um, but we also have a number of papers, especially uh, in the past year, um, looking at the quota uh, policies of the 1920s. And that's where um, our paper sits. Um, OK, so I want to say um, a bit more on the policy variation and how we use it. Um, and then um, on um, the effect of border closure on population flows and on occupational switching. And to do that, I'll have to explain to you um, some matched census data that we bring into the analysis that allows us to follow individuals over a decade so we can look at who's flowing in and out of locations among the native born. And for those native born who stay in the location, um, what kinds of occupational switches do we see? And this um, approach is actually uh, quite similar to uh, a few recent papers um, using European administrative data to look at uh, some immigration, um, not policy change, but some immigration inflows in Europe and then how native born respond um, in terms of switching occupations or leaving an area. So we're the first to be able to do this in the historical context. All right. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we have two sources of variation. We have before and after the major policy change, and then we assign that down to the local level. So let me first show you on this picture here um, the before and after type um, uh, variation. So um, I've grouped uh, the, some of the major sending countries. Uh, in order to put everyone on one slide, we're looking at only nine countries here. Um, but I've grouped them into um, Southern and Eastern Europe. In the middle, we have Northern and Western Europe. And on the end, we have the Americas. The blue bars here um, are inflows over an unrestricted decade, 1900 to 10. And the green bars are the quota slots allocated to those countries in the 1920s. Adding up year by year, how many would have been allocated 21 to 24 under the first set of policies, and then 24 and thereafter. And so what we see for Southern and Eastern Europe is that um, for these three sending countries, we have 1.5 to 2 million entrants um, over the decade of 1900. But then um, the allocation of quota slots was 100 to 300,000. So we have an order of magnitude decline uh, in the number of legal entrants. Um, and then the red bars here show you how many people actually entered from these locations uh, from 20 to 30. And those numbers are a bit higher than the quotas uh, because we have a um, unrestricted year, 20 to 21. And if you look annually instead of decadally, we see that these quotas are completely binding. Um, for the Northern and Western European case, um, we see that there were some countries, like in Scandinavia, where the quota was binding. Um, and we see rejections of around 50% um, uh, of quota slots relative to inflow. Um, and then other cases, like Germany, for example, where the quota was actually not binding at all, um, and that even in the decade of unrestricted migration, 1900 to 10, there were fewer entrants than allocated in the quotas. And then finally, in um, the uh, Americas, these were entirely unrestricted immigration flows, both in 1900 to 10 and 20 to 30. And we see that, uh, especially in the case of Canada, but also Mexico, um, there may have been even some um, response to the policy. So that um, when there's restriction um, of Scandinavians, there might be Canadians coming across the border um, into the upper Midwest, for example. Now, the second um, element of the variation is uh, breaking the US, US up into local areas and assessing what share of the population would have been affected by the quota. Um, now, I'm going to show you on this slide um, the whole country and also a very naive measure of um, the share of the, of the population affected, which is just what share of the population comes from any quota restricted country. So that's going to count Scandinavians in the same way as, as it would count Italians. Um, and we think that there is actually more effect if, um, in your local area if you have a greater share of your population you know, from the southern and eastern European countries. But just to begin, um, this is essentially capturing the share of the population that comes from Europe. Um, and we see that the, at, um, scaled out in this way, uh, the majority of the variation comes essentially from uh, south relative to the rest of the country. So in the south, we have very little immigrant stock in 1900. 
Um, and then uh, in the plains and in the west, as well as in the urban areas of the northeast and midwest, uh, we see that there was substantial immigrant population. Um, so uh, we want to do something a little bit more sophisticated than that and use the fact that for various restricted countries, the restrictions were more severe. So imagine um, a location um, that has immigrant population from three different areas, Italy, Sweden, and the UK, and each represent 5% of the population. So under that simple measure that I just showed you, um, we would say that 15% of the population was potentially affected by the policy. Um, but we know uh, that um, the a policy was binding to varying degrees across those countries, so that 95% of the flow from Italy was restricted, but only 10% of the flow from the UK. Uh, and so instead, um, what we're interested in is this weighted share of the population um, that comes uh, from a um, quota-restricted country. Um, and in that case, only 7.5% 7, 7 of the population was actually affected in that area. Um, so uh, now zooming in on the Northeast versus the, uh, the Northeast and Midwest, um, we see uh, our naive measure, the share of the population from any quota country, relative to our more sophisticated measure, the share of the population affected by the quota. Um, and uh, what we see is basically a leveling down, but not an equal leveling down everywhere. So there are some locations using our naive measure that are 50% foreign born, or 50% from Europe, um, and we don't see any such places on the right-hand side. But we also see uh, that, for example, a place like Wisconsin has, a, um, has lower shading on the right than it does on the left relative to other states, because those are locations, for example, with a lot of Germans. Um, and so this is the measure that we're going to be using throughout the paper, um, which we call the share of the population affected by the quota, um, and comes from um, a, a, a set of weights that look very much like this example, where we have the um, share of the flow restricted by the policy, um, weighted by the actual share of the population in 1900 from that country. Um, and then you know, uh, the equation for that weight is down here. Um, and it's not terribly relevant for what we're doing, um, but I will sort of bring it back in one more time uh, before uh, the end of my remarks. OK, so our empirical framework then, we're going to stack data from uh, two decades at the state economic area level. That's our area of, um, that's our measure of location. Uh, state economic areas are clusters of counties. There are around 400 of them in the US. And you can see those represented here. So that's sort of how large a state economic area would be. It's roughly equivalent to commuting zones today. Um, and uh, we have. Um, two decades of data, one from 1900 to 10 in the unrestricted period, and one from 1920 to 30 um, after the policy is in place. Um, our main right-hand side variable of interest is going to be um, the share of the population affected by the policy, and then an interaction between that share and being after the policy is in place. So it's a standard continuous diff and diff, where we have a measure of policy exposure and then we have a measure of being after the policy nationwide, and then the interaction between the two. Our first stage, as you might want to think about it, is just was the policy binding? Did these locations receive fewer, fewer migrant inflows from abroad? And that will be the change in the foreign-born population to that area, normalized by the initial working age population. So rather than looking at changes in the share foreign-born, we want to look at the changes in the actual bodies, foreign born in the numerator, divided by initial population. And this was recommended by Perry and Sparber because the denominator would otherwise be an outcome of interest. It could be that this policy would affect overall population. And in fact, we find that it does. And so we don't want there to be population changing in the denominator if we want to focus on the change in the number of bodies coming from abroad. Now, the same thing is going to be um, the case for, the, for our other outcomes. So when we look at the native born, um, we sort of classify this into the effect on city growth and then the effect on sector of economic activity. When we're looking at city growth, we're looking at the change in the native born population, similarly normalized. And then when we look at sectors of economic activity, we'll look at the change in the native born population in farming, in blue collar work, in white collar work, 
and in the no occupation category, and we'll decompose that into occupational shifting for those who stay in the area, and then um, inflows and outflows. Um, so this is really a perfect paper for um, a demography audience because this is really like a core demography paper where we're just counting people and we're looking at inflows and outflows. Um, and so I was quite pleased to be able to present this here. Um, and so just um, to express what I just said um, in an equation, for example, when our outcome is the change in the foreign population to the area, normalized by initial population, um, we could imagine having um, the share of the population affected by the policy and then the indicator for being after the policy and then the interaction. But rather than doing that, we'll just put in state, uh, SEA fixed effects. So that's going to absorb a fixed attribute like the share of the population affected by the policy and then we'll be estimating the interaction. So the main thing we're going to be looking at are these beta coefficients, which will tell us about differential immigrant inflows in this particular case to locations that were separated by one percentage point in the share of their population affected by the policy. Okay, because this is going, this is, um, this um, QR weighted is a share of the population or a percentage of the population, I should say. So each coefficient can be interpreted as what happens when there's a one percentage point additional um, share of the population affected by the policy after the border closure is enacted. Um, so our identifying assumption here is um, it can very well be the case that areas with many quota immigrants have long-standing differences. So we saw that cities in the, nor in the north, like New York, have high share of the population quota affected, and rural areas in the south do not. And so we're, we allow for the fact that there can be long-standing differences between those places with our state economic area fixed effects. But our identifying assumption is that these locations would have followed similar trends over the 1920s if not for the border closure. Now think about that when our outcome or population flows. What we're saying is that New York would be growing at the same rate as rural South. And that you know, seems implausible you know, if the only thing that's changing over the 1920s is the border closure. The 1920s was also a period of rapid economic expansion um, targeted towards industrial areas. So there's a concern that especially high urbanized SEAs could be growing faster over the 1920s for other reasons. Um, so what we want to do is control for a whole set of other 1900 characteristics interacted with after the policy, allowing there to be differential trends in population size, share urban, blue collar, farm, manufacturing, share of the um, population in the labor force, and then the unrestricted immigrant category, Canada and Mexico. And then we also would want to control for either region interacted with 1920s or state interacted with 1920s to absorb the north-south differences. Um, so uh, let's get to um, results. We have 15 minutes. Um, so uh, everything um, we're going to look at now is denominated in bodies. Um, and so once we talk about one set of results, we can kind of pretty quickly scan through the rest. So the first thing to look at is, was the policy binding? Did areas with larger initial clusters of quota immigrants have fewer immigrant inflows in the 20s? Um, so uh, what we find is that um, the answer is yes. And how do we interpret uh, the magnitude of that relationship? What this means is that areas with one percentage point additional quota affected population in 1900 lost 1.3 additional immigrants per 100 residents in 1920. So we've divided not just by initial population, but initial population in hundreds, so that it's very easy for us to read these coefficients as bodies lost per hundred in the population. Uh, so uh, if you're talking about a place that has one percentage point additional um, quota restricted population, it's something um, like Mercer County, New Jersey, relative to the county that's one um, adjacent to us. Um, westward, okay? So we're talking about a more, a slightly more urbanized and immigrant-centered location like Mercer County relative to a county that's further inland towards Pennsylvania. Uh, so in that case, a location like Mercer County would have lost an additional one immigrant per hundred in the population due to the border closure. And that loss um, is mostly coming from Southern and Eastern Europeans, though not entirely, it's around two-thirds, one-third. So that's 
sort of a first starting point. We really wouldn't be able to go into the paper if this were not the case. And now we want to assess um, what does this mean for the native born. And so now our um, sort of our headline um, outcome is the change in the native born population divided by initial population in hundreds. And we see that in those locations, after uh, the policy change, um, a place that has one percentage point additional uh, quota affected population also lost 1.4 natives. So they lose almost 1.4 immigrants and they lose 1.4 natives. So we see almost a one-to-one -one relationship there. Um, and uh, we want to separate that into natives who are not flowing in versus natives who are leaving. And with the aggregate data, we can't look at inflows and outflows. That's something we can do with our match data. But one proxy that we can look at in the aggregate data are the number of native born who were born out of state and the number of native born who were born in state. We actually see no change in the number of native born born in state. So it doesn't look like the locals are leaving, but we see far fewer natives who have been born out of state. So what's going on is a reduction in internal in migrants um, among natives. Um, so um, I am going to uh, skip over, for the most part, sort of what the rest of this table would be. But basically, um, what I wanted to say is just that um, these coefficients are less interpretable than something like this, the implied effect of one immigrant arrival. These are just policy coefficients that are saying, in policy-affected areas, after the policy is in place, what happens? But what we really want to know is, for one fewer immigrant arrival, how many fewer natives? And so essentially what you can do is calculate a walled estimator, um, which is basically dividing this coefficient here by this one. So this is our first stage, and this is our reduced form, and then we could fill in this part here with a walled estimator. And then why do I have this card IV column over here? Because essentially most of the literature in economics um, that looks at the effect of immigrants on natives uses a card or a Bartik IV. Those um, papers essentially do not have policy changes. But um, what we have worked out is that if you were to use policy-based variation, you could feed that variation into a standard card or Bartik IV. And the expression you would get is almost identical to the continuous diff and diff that we're showing you here. The benefit of the card IV is that it directly does this translation for you, where what you're estimating is the effect of foreign arrivals on native arrivals. And so you don't have to go ahead and do a, a walled estimator and divide by a first stage. But what you're losing out on is that typically you're not focusing there on policy variation. And so um, there's a way of marrying these two. And the answer uh, that you get, this is just a few slides showing the relationship. The answer that you get is almost, in, almost exactly the same. So if you instead feed the policy variation into a card IV, um, you still get this one-to-one -one relationship where one immigrant arrival um, leads to one native arrival, or one immigrant lost from the policy leads to one native lost, and that's exactly what you get from dividing our two coefficients here um, with the walled estimator. Um, so these two approaches are really not that different, and what tends to happen is that economists don't usually have the policy variation, and so they build everything into, a, um, a, into this bar ticker card IV, but there's a recent literature, um, some of this is from some of our colleagues here, um, like this AKM paper, essentially saying that Bartik and card IVs are basically sets of weighted difference and differences anyway. And what is not so great about that is that it becomes a black box and you're not sure exactly which diff and diff you're using and relying on. And maybe then you forget to, for example, add those controls that I added at the beginning, where I said, well, here's our identifying assumption. That becomes quite clear when you put things in a diff and diff context. And therefore, here are the additional things you might want to control for. Uh, OK, um, so I'm going to end by um, going back to this idea of substitution versus scale effects. Um, and uh, so far, we've already found evidence that seems more consistent with scale effects. Because if immigrants and natives were substitutes in the labor market, um, and immigrants stop coming because of the policy, well, surely we would expect uh, natives to be flowing in, and that's not what we see. But it's all the more so if we look within occupations. Because the immigrants um, that were uh, restricted by the policy were not evenly weighted across all of the occupational categories. What we see here is that the immigrants, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe, were concentrated in blue-collar work. So 15% of the blue-collar 
workforce was Southern and Eastern European and only 4% of the farm workforce. So it's an all the more so type of argument that if substitution effects are dominating, we're expecting the native born to flow into these areas, and we know they don't, but especially to flow in to blue collar work because now they're no longer facing this competition from immigrants. Instead, we see the opposite. We see that the native born are flowing out of blue collar work, both because we have internal migrants not coming who would have taken blue collar jobs, and because even for the folks who are located in the area and don't leave, we see them actually flowing out of blue collar work and not into it. In order to do that, we need the matched data because we need to know about for occupational switching, what occupation was someone holding in 1920 and then what are they doing in 1930? And we also need to know for, um, we need to identify who's an in-migrant and who's an out-migrant to see what, were, what are the in-migrants doing once they arrive and what were the out-migrants doing before they left. So to do that, we build two matched data sets, one for 1900 to 10 and one for 1920 to 30. So we're not following the same people over this whole period, but we're following people over a decade. We're creating these links by first name, last name, age, and state of birth using computer algorithms so we can assess robustness. There is some debate within economic history about what the right uh, matching algorithm would be. Um, this is from the um, complete count digitized census data that um, Ancestry.com and Minnesota Population Center put together. And Princeton is actually, OPR is actually a site, um, one of the site licenses around the country where this data is available. Um, okay, so um, here's what we find. Um, so this is a table that would have many um, uh, numbers in it. And um, essentially, the first column would decompose that total change in native born population that I showed you at the beginning into um, a white collar, blue collar farm and no occupation, okay? And so what we see is a lot of um, decline after the policy is enacted in the number of native born who are in blue collar positions. And then you can also decompose in this direction because if the number of native born in blue collar positions is falling, it could happen for two reasons. It could be that no one is moving in or out but you have people flowing out of blue collar work into something else after the policy. Um, or it could be that no one who stays changes occupation, but you just have inflows and outflows of blue collar type workers leaving um, or uh, people who would take blue collar work or jobs not coming in. And what we find is a little bit of both. So we see for the stayers, people um, who were not in blue collar work but are moving to blue collar work that number is falling. The second number tells us that people who were in blue collar work at the beginning of the period are more likely to leave and go somewhere else, either white collar, farm, or no occupation. So on both margins, we see that stayers are flowing away from blue collar work. And on net, we get the number here just by adding these two coefficients. Now, finally, we look at the movers, and we see that there are far fewer people moving in who take blue-collar positions. And then the one coefficient that goes in the other direction are these levers. So we actually see some of the existing blue-collar workers leaving the area after the policy. Okay? So then you can add up those two, and on net, we have a reduction of around half a person per hundred in the population. Um, uh, leaving blue, uh, who are not in blue collar work because of inflows and outflows. We have around 0.2 of a person per 100 in the population uh, not in blue collar work because of occupational switching. And then we add those together and we get the, the, the number at, on the, um, in the first column. So that fully decomposes where the reduction in native born blue collar comes from. And um, ar around 70% um, of it comes from what's going on with internal migrants. So when the policy is enacted and immigrants are not flowing in to these areas, we also have natives not flowing in and precisely the natives who would be in blue collar work. Those are the ones who are not coming in. So it's not like the natives in white collar work only who might be complementary with immigrants in a factory. It's actually the, blue, the natives in blue collar work who are not flowing in, which is precisely the opposite of what we would think if we're in a world where substitution effects are dominating. Um, so then the final um, result would then just include all of these categories, 
Um, and I've grayed out the main coefficients just because there's a lot of numbers here. Um, just to say uh, that when we think about overall um, reductions in um, native born entry, we have much of it coming from blue collar, but also a chunk of it coming from white collar as well. Um, and in fact, going in the opposite direction, um, we actually have um, some native attraction to the area in this no occupation category. Um, then if we think about each one of these coefficients, we can see how much is coming from occupational switching and how much of it is coming um, from internal migration. Um, but the bottom line there is that much of what we see is coming from internal migration. Um, all of the results on the occupational switching go in the, in the same direction. For the most part, farm is an exception, but for the most part, all of the results in, on occupational switching for the stayers goes in the same direction. But the main margin of change is coming from who's moving into the area. Uh, so um, I will close by saying uh, two things. Um, one is that our goal is to try to um, apply this type of approach to the reopening of the borders. So um, many of you are going to be familiar with the 1965 um, Immigration and Naturalization Act. Um, and uh, this policy had um, differential effects on different parts of the world as well. Um, so um, it did expand uh, access to the US from European countries um, and from Asian countries, um, but it limited access to the US, at least statutorily, from the Americas. Okay, so before the 1965 Act, entry from um, the Americas was nominally unrestricted, and then restrictions were imposed. Europe and Asia were facing these severe quotas, and those quotas were lifted to a certain degree. And so we would imagine perhaps being able to put together the same type of approach uh, for today. But of course, what you know about this era is that um, this was a period of booming migration from the Americas. So even though statutorily access was limited, um, those um, restrictions were not binding. And so indeed, what we find when we sort of do a, a first pass at this approach with the modern case is that we don't really have the first stage that we have for the 1920s. Before we even made any progress on the 1920s, we said, well, first we need to see that this policy is actually restricting inflow, and it was. But when we look at the modern case, we see exactly those places where you think statutorily um, there should be restriction. Those were the places that were receiving the most migrants. I mean, so it's not surprising given what we know about the, the period. Um, but um, perhaps we'll have um, some more success in looking at, for example, some um, Cold War policies um, to try to get a little bit closer to the modern period. And the reason why we want to do that is because we certainly don't want anyone to take our results from the historical period and apply that to today. And so our conclusion is that um, as the current observers of, in the 1920s noted, historical immigration did facilitate urban growth and industrialization in the US, and that after the border closed, Areas that lost more immigrants also lost native internal migrants, particularly in blue collar positions. Um, but we don't expect similar effects today um, because, first of all, the policy today seems not to be binding, but also the scope for urban growth in the US and the scope for transitioning out of farming into, into industry is no longer present. And so the types of interactions that would take place in the economy are different today. So we want this. Um, uh, our, our estimates to be benchmark estimates for the historical period and give us some understanding about how immigration contributed to long-run economic growth in the US, but not something that you would take to the policy uh, arena today. Okay, thank you.